Dr. Fortas is a body expert representing the Houston, Texas market. He is a double board certified plastic surgeon, an artist, and a leading aesthetic plastic surgeon in Houston. He has built a very strong reputation over the 22 years he has been in private practice as an aesthetic plastic surgeon. He has lectured domestically and internationally on body contouring, and now he has a safety course presented yearly at the American Society of Aesthetic Plastic Surgery's meeting on body contouring surgery. Welcome, Dr. Fortis. Thank you, good to be here. Thank you for being here with us. Next, we have Dr. Samra. Dr. Asad Samra is a breast expert representing the New Jersey market. He has been board certified by the American Board of Plastic Surgery since 2008 and has been chosen as a top doctor in cosmetic and reconstructive surgery by the Consumer Research Council of America from 2011 to 2020, as well as top doctor by New Jersey Top Docs in 2020. Dr. Samra has been the medical director for the Center of Wound Healing in Bayshore Hospital since 2008, and he has led that team to receive two Center of Excellence awards. Welcome, Dr. Samra. Thank you, thank you, April, appreciate it. Pleasure to be here with uh, Dr. Fortes. Great to have both of you here. Are you each seeing patients by any chance in your respective offices? You know, <clears throat> I'm seeing patients who uh, ha are still recovering from surgery that they had prior to uh, the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And so we have continued to see them uh, and I've been taking care of them on a regular basis. Of course, uh, we're limiting uh, the number of people that come into our office at one time. We're making sure that um, they're not sick. Uh, we call ahead and make sure that they're okay and that they've not had any significant risk factors for exposure to coronavirus. And uh, if we can get by with a virtual uh, follow-up, we have done that. And new patients, we've, uh, we've been doing consultations virtually. So it's a, it's a new uh, way of doing business in our offices. What about you, Dr. Samra? Yeah, so uh, very similar to what Paul said, uh, most of the patients that I see, and, and so far we had scaled back to just about a half a day uh, a week in-person visits. And that's for people who have uh, needs for immediate in-person, if you will, uh, evaluation, whether because they had surgery just prior to the quarantine uh, lockdown. Uh, and or because of the fact that they had recently some emergency or urgent type cases, I still do some emergency call, whether that be for facial lacerations or even uh, hand trauma. Uh, so sometimes those patients uh, have offered uh, rather options to leave the hospital or even bypass the hospital and receive care in our office. Uh, and that's both to their convenience and candidly mine so that neither of us are being exposed to the hospital environment. Uh, those patients then will be seen in follow up in the office of course, whether for suture removal or splint change. Uh, similar to Paul, uh, I've been thrust into the virtual uh, consultation or virtual telehealth world. Uh, I always knew about it and uh, wasn't really sure how it was gonna fit into my practice, uh, but uh, clearly had to learn real quick. And uh, I have found that it's been a very helpful tool uh, and quite candidly, quite an efficient tool. Uh, <laughs> I tend to chat quite a bit with my patients and sometimes the visits go a little bit longer than intended. Uh, but in the virtual world, it seems as if we don't really go off on a tangent as much. And so uh, I've been able to be much more efficient with the use of my time doing these uh, virtual consults and or virtual follow-ups. Uh, and it's been comforting for the patients to know that they can get in touch with me whenever they need to, me that I can get a hold of them and, and both physically see how uh, things are healing and or how they're doing, you know, mentally or emotionally. Um, and it's been pretty quick. So uh, Still seeing patients to answer your question directly, and it's been a combination of uh, virtual and in person, but uh, nowhere near as you know, busy as we were once, once upon a time. Thank you, Dr. Samra. Sure. Thank I you, agree. Dr. Fortis. We're going to go ahead and start delving into our question and answer session. Dr. Fortis, this question is for you. You offer liposculpting. Who's a good candidate for liposculpting, and how does the procedure work? Well, 
I always ask the patient what their motivation is. And if the motivation is about reshaping the body, then just about anybody who is in, in good health uh, is a candidate for, for surgery. The, the one patients that I um, caution not to do body contouring as a way to achieve a goal is, is the goal. And, and I don't see this quite, I don't see this very often um, because I think people understand the nature of body contouring surgery. And they, and the one group that I really advise not to are the ones that may use it as an alternative to weight management or weight control. That's probably the, the one group that I, I caution against using um, operations like uh, liposuction as an alternative to really making life choices and um, lifestyle choices to maintain uh, healthy habits, healthy weights. Um, even the ones that may have uh, concerns about their weight I, I don't immediately say that they're not candidates, but I have to educate them on the role of body contouring and, and as it relates to weight management. They, they have to go hand in hand. You can't have a discussion about body contouring uh, without discussing weight management because patients hear uh, that uh, liposuction removes fat cells permanently and they equate that to mean that it's, it's an alternative to a uh, good diet and exercise, a good diet and exercise program. And it, and it really is. Do you see that often there? What percentage of people that come in for that procedure fall into that category? That they use uh, body contouring as an alternative to weight management? Yes. I will have a long conversation with them if, uh, if they struggle with weight and I will, even recommend for someone who probably is a candidate for weight loss surgery to consider that and or to make serious um, changes in their life and not not to make changes that are temporary but really to make a, a concerted effort to uh, change um, make changes that they can maintain and they can be consistent about Thank so I, I don't really see a, a lot of patients <clears throat> who, who specifically come in thinking that um, body contouring surgery is an alternative to weight management, because I think a lot of people these days um, know that it isn't. Thank you, Dr. Fortes. Dr. Samra, over to you. When a patient wants to see an improvement in their breast, how do you work together with them throughout the process to establish what they need, what expectations should be? Can you expand a little bit on that relationship? Sure, patient. sure. That, that's, a, that's a great question and perhaps uh, one of the most uh, important questions uh, as it pertains to planning breast surgery is trying to understand what the patient's goals are, what their expectations are, and um, how we can, if we can, achieve them. Um, so essentially, uh, whether we're talking about a breast reduction or a breast augmentation or a breast lift, which would fit within all these uh, discussion that we're talking about with breast surgery, I, I first want to understand what the patient's motivation is, just as Paul had uh, uh, mentioned in terms of understanding what brought them here in the first place, uh, as that can potentially give me some sort of a window into uh, what their goal is and or perhaps what their, again, motivation. Uh, as we get to the point of talking about potentially things such as an augmentation, uh, some of the times I will ask patients if they have a particular volume or aesthetic, whether uh, upper breast fullness or projection, uh, for example, that they have in mind that would help me in terms of guiding them as to choose an implant that makes the most sense for the aesthetic they're hoping to accomplish. Uh, with breast reduction, uh, most of the time uh, patients are uh, very bothered by heavy uh, breasts that are weighing them down. And sometimes they seem to be more concerned about just getting the weight off and not necessarily being uh, aesthetically minded. And that's typically in patients that are much larger breasted. Uh, sometimes patients are smaller breasted and much more aesthetically minded than they are in weight reduction. 
And so then, and by weight, I'm talking about, of course, their, their breast weight. Uh, and in that case, sometimes you have to remind the person who's large breasted, who just quote unquote, doesn't care what it looks like that I care what it looks like. And then there is an aesthetic that's associated with that. And then the person who is more aesthetically minded and just worried about the scarring have to remind them that unfortunately we haven't figured out a way to do surgery without creating scars. Uh, once we figure that out, well, I guess uh, the uh, dam will open up. But uh, beyond that, uh, essentially we uh, uh, spend a lot of time, you know, talking with patients, helping them understand the risks of surgery and helping them understand the benefits of surgery, helping them understand what are potentially some of the cons or consequences of having uh, surgery. Um, and then ultimately uh, together we come to a plan where we're placing incisions, what we uh, assume that the post-operative scarring will look like, what we anticipate the timeline of how things will uh, look from a perspective of initial swelling and some more obvious scarring to as time going on, less swelling and less obvious scarring. Uh, we tend to recommend a lot of uh, scar care, whether with silicone treatments or, uh, and those are silicone pads or sheets um, and or scar massage and, and things of that nature to try to hopefully give them uh, as good of an outcome with uh, at least obvious scarring as possible. Thank you, Dr. Samra. Dr. Fortis, to you, what does a mommy makeover consist of? <clears throat> well, mommy makeover really is a series of procedures that are intended to uh, improve a woman's body, uh, especially after a uh, woman's body has undergone changes from pregnancies. And uh, it can involve breast work and body work. And in terms of uh, the breast work that I do uh, as part of a mommy makeover, a woman may have experienced uh, extreme volume changes of the breast where they become much larger during the pregnancy and even uh, maintain that size during the breastfeeding period if she breastfeeds. When the hormones return to the pre-pregnancy level, often there's a, there are changes in the breast that causes the volume to reduce. And the combination of uh, expansion of, of the breast and the, and the breast skin followed by loss of, of the volume leads the breast to be, become droopy. And so often I talk to patients about restoring the appearance of the breast to a more youthful appearance by uh, either adding volume or lifting the breast or maybe a combination of the two. Uh, and even in some cases involving um, three different options, including maybe reducing a portion of the breast that has a tendency to, for sagging, uh, lifting the breast, and even using an implant for shaping purposes or even making the breast fuller. So many different combinations of things. It's not just one single thing um, that I discuss with a patient. So it, it really is patient dependent. As far as the body work, you know, uh, pregnancies have profound effects on the, on the abdomen. And not only uh, changes in the skin, where the skin can become droopy and sag uh, and develop multiple stretch marks, but uh, just as important, the changes that happen deep to the skin to the muscle layers. The muscles often um, start to bulge out and uh, develop a, a space between the two major muscles um, that make up the front of the abdomen wall. And this creates a bulge that even in, in very slender women can continue the, um, that doesn't revert back to how the abdomen looked prior to the pregnancy. So, uh, abdominal plasties often are part of the discussion uh, that I have with patients who come in for mommy makeovers. And I also can, it's, it's sometimes will also include the discussion about reducing fat in areas where the fat tends to be stubborn and, and not create a, a, a flattering body shape or silhouette and, and even adding fat. In the area where we have been, or I have been doing Fat grafting, uh, and it's become, uh, it almost goes hand in hand with uh, liposuction, is fat grafting of the buttock, and not necessarily for the purpose of creating an, an exaggerated appearance of the buttock, but really also for shaping. So all those things can enter into uh, the discussion with a woman who has finished having her children, has had changes of her body, she's not happy with, and she'd like to see improved. So any combination of those procedures that I mentioned can become part of the discussion 
that I have with a, with a woman when she comes in for a mommy makeover. So it's an operation that I, that I love doing and that I do often. Um, you know, women can come in in uh, their late 20s after they've had a child and they feel like they're ready for a mommy makeover. And I've had women that, are, that come in, you know, in their 40s and even later for their, for their mommy makeover. So it's a, it's a wonderful operation. I love doing them and I love talking to patients about them. And, and, I, and probably the most important thing is that I love seeing the profound changes uh, in how they feel about their bodies and their breasts after they've had a mommy makeover. Thank you, Dr. Fortas. We have an audience question for you along those lines. What muscle damage is done um, in a bikini cesarean? Well, with a cesarean, usually the, the incision is made rather low. And um, I'm, I'm certainly not a gynecologist, so uh, the technical aspects of, uh, of a cesarean uh, are very much within the purview of what uh, gynecologists and obstetricians do. But the incision goes not just through the skin, but also the lower abdomen uh, wall. And, uh, but probably what I see happen uh, in, in women who have had C-section deliveries is that scar tends to become tethered and accentuates the loose skin and muscles above it. And so what they, what they start to, to see and not be happy about is that this, the C-section scar, uh, which is not just a skin scar, but it's also a, a scar that goes all the way through the abdomen wall. The scar tends to, in some cases, accentuate the loose skin above it and become uh, uncomfortable and Usually, when I do an abdominoplasty uh, in women who have had C-section deliveries, the, the entire C-section scar gets removed. And so we start completely fresh uh, with uh, a brand new scar that I take pride in closing um, as well as possible so that it looks as uh, minimal as possible. And, uh, and of course, because with a, with a tummy tuck, we're removing the excess skin above it, then everything looks smoother and much better and probably feels more comfortable for the patient also. Thank you so much, Dr. Fortas. Dr. Samra, this is for you. What is the downtime like after getting a breast lift? Is the recovery similar to implants? Uh, it's, it's quite different actually in that uh, typically when we're doing a breast lift, uh, we are tightening the breast skin, removing excess skin and repositioning the nipple up higher. There's usually not any work done to the underlying muscle or pec muscle. Uh, whereas with a, a breast augmentation or putting in a breast implant, usually that is a below the muscle uh, implant placement. It doesn't have to be, of course, there are techniques in which it's done above the muscle, but usually it's a below the muscle uh, procedure and uh, once you uh, manipulate the muscle, that can extend and usually does extend the recovery. So for a, a breast lift, uh, perhaps for the more common uh, breast lift patient that I take care of, I tell them that their recovery is somewhere in the ballpark of about three or four weeks. Uh, and that's to allow for swelling to improve, bruising to improve. Uh, there is still some change overall as the breast takes a more natural shape over uh, the weeks beyond that. Uh, whereas with a breast implant, I usually tell them it's more like a four to six week recovery, again, because of the uh, pressure on the muscle and the muscle having to stretch potentially over the implant and me not wanting the patient to be too active with their upper body exercising or uh, lifting or pushing or pulling uh, during that initial four to six week period of time. So it's about three to four weeks for a breast lift, more like four to six weeks for breast implants. Thank you, Dr. Samra. Dr. Fortis, down to you. If someone wants to come in for a Brazilian butt lift, what should they know ahead of time? It's a very popular operation that I do and, and I do in combination with uh, liposuction. Uh, really the Brazilian butt lift um, is, is done in concert with really a full evaluation of the body 
because it's not so much of adding fat to the butt, although you know that's a, essentially what the operation entails, but it's also about reshaping areas around the buttock so that the buttock looks better. And uh, a perfect example of, of this, of what I mean by this, is that often the buttock may look flat simply because there's excess uh, fat that's deposited in the lower back. And so there's almost like a, con there's almost a continuum in, in the shape of the lower back onto the buttock that really does not create a flattering shape or a flattering silhouette. So by reducing the fat in the, in the lower back and in the flank area and, and using that fat during the same operation to augment or fill the buttock, both contribute to the overall improvement of the buttock. Um, you know, the, I do the operation also in combination with abdominal plastic surgery and, and patients ask me, um, should I lay on my back? Should I lay on my stomach? What do I do after uh, the operation? And I say, the most important thing to do is to lay on soft surfaces, uh, sit properly so that you do not sit on the fleshy part of the buttock when you're sitting, when you're lying. Be sure to do make positional changes frequently so that you're not laying in on a in an area for prolonged periods of time. Um, but these are the important things to to keep in mind during the early recovery period after uh, after Brazilian butt lift. And of course, um, the, the entire recovery may take several months. And during that time, uh, fat cells, uh, mature fat cells that are, that are used um, to reshape the buttock um, stabilize. Uh, stem cells uh, that are part of the fat that we reduce uh, from the liposuction areas mature into mature fat cells. And so that whole process may take several months. Uh, and so I, I tell patients to be patient with the result and often um, with a reduction of swelling in, in surrounding areas, um, the body shape just gets better and better over time. Thank you, Dr. Fortas. Dr. Samra, over to you. Yeah. You offer breast reconstruction surgery for women who want to rebuild their breast following treatment from cancer. What is that process like? And I'm sure every case is, is different. Also, is breastfeeding possible? So um, unfortunately, in the setting of breast uh, reconstruction, taking your second question or your last question first, uh, typically the breast has been removed. And so breast uh, feeding is uh, not, uh, not possible. Uh, breast reconstruction, which is pretty much a broad term to describe recreating the breast after it has been removed, uh, typically due to cancer treatments, uh, is a big part of my practice and, and something that uh, I do quite, uh, quite commonly. Uh, there are two main ways that uh, breast reconstruction can be done. Uh, the most common way, both in my practice and arguably in the nation, is doing implant-based uh, breast reconstruction which means to recreate the breast mound by using a breast implant. Uh, the most common way that is done is in a two-step process uh, in which the patient at the time that their breast is removed, which is called a mastectomy, uh, a temporary breast implant is placed and that temporary implant is called a tissue expander. And that's because that uh, implant has the ability to be filled with saline or salt water after surgery that then expands the breast, hence the name tissue expander. Uh, the tissue expander uh, placed at the time of mastectomy usually has some amount of saline in it. And then over the course of about two to three weeks, after we've uh, got confidence that the patient's incisions are healing well, we add some more um, saline into that expander, stretching out the breast, preparing it for the second step, which is when we take the tissue expander out and we put the breast implant in. Typically, the breast implant is a silicone breast implant, uh, very similar to the types of implants that we use in uh, cosmetic surgery. Uh, sometimes we would use larger volumes than we would with uh, the cosmetic patient because now the entire breast is based on that uh, implant that we're using rather than it augmenting what's already there. Um, 
the other way that implant-based breast reconstruction can be done, if there is enough skin to work with, at the time of the mastectomy, it, we skip that whole tissue expansion process and the silicone implant is placed at that time instead. And that's part of your point of every case being a little bit different. And so therefore we uh, make those decisions based upon what we see at the, in consultation and perhaps more importantly, what we see at the time of surgery as that can influence the decisions that are made. The other type of breast reconstruction that is done uh, quite routinely now, although not as commonly as implants, is something called autologous breast reconstruction, which basically means uh, using the tissue that the patient has to reconstruct their own breast. So auto meaning from themselves. Uh, the most common part of the body that we take a skin and fat to reconstruct the breast is from the abdomen, from the lower abdomen. So actually the tissue that would be removed in a tummy tuck, that tissue, for example, is what would be used and transferred up to create the breast. Uh, that technique and, and how that tissue is transferred up has changed over the years, where it used to be connected to one of the six pack muscles and rotated up. That's referred to as a TRAM, T-R-A-M flap. Uh, then there became some refinements in what's called microsurgery, where surgeons can take a microscope and under the microscope, they can find the little blood vessels, the artery and the vein and suture them together or co op them together. Uh, as microsurgery techniques and technology has improved, so have the refinements in how that tissue is transferred. And so now uh, there is a, a procedure called the DEEP, D-I-E-P, a deep flap. And a deep flap is a type of procedure in which we try to use only the skin and fat of the abdomen and the blood vessel, not using the muscle at all to try to minimize any sort of core weakness that the patient may have. So a deep flap surgery is an example of using your own tissue to reconstruct the breast. Uh, other examples are taking skin and muscle even from the back and rotating it forward toward the, to reconstruct the breast, but usually there's not enough volume, so that's done with uh, an implant. So how to cancel, uh, counsel rather patients on, on the, what to do, typically I go through a very similar discussion as we just did in terms of helping them understand what the options that are out there are available to them in terms of reconstruction. I remind them as some patients come in thinking that this is silly and they're being vain and they should really be concentrating on uh, their, their cancer, that that is very much not the case. And in fact, uh, in the mid nineties, it became a national law that women should have breast reconstruction, not forcing them to have it, but that they should be entitled to have it and that that should be something that's covered by insurance. Not only should their breast that's being reconstructed be covered, but the law went so far as to say that anything that would need to be done to the opposite breast, to lift the opposite breast, reduce the opposite breast, to augment the opposite breast, that also should be covered by insurance. So I remind them of that to help them feel a little bit more comfortable that this is not a, a vain endeavor uh, and or a, uh, only a cosmetically minded thing, but something that can potentially uh, make them feel better about themselves and, and feel more whole. Um, in terms of choosing between the implant-based options and their own tissue options, uh, most people do gravitate toward the implants, and I think that's because of the fact that it sounds a little bit more simple and straightforward as the surgery is confined to just their breasts rather than to their breast and another part of their body, whether it be their abdomen or their uh, back. Um, and uh, typically that decision is very personal and uh, can um, be changed based upon how things are progressing, even in their healing, meaning that maybe we initially chose implants and we thought that that was going to be the best choice for them. Uh, but perhaps in their post-operative recovery, uh, they were advised that they needed radiation treatments and then the radiation could potentially affect the way that their skin is healing. And so that now we may opt to use a flap because now that we would bring a part of their body that hasn't been radiated, that can help to uh, correct some of the uh, radiation damages that have happened. So um, that's uh, kind of a mouthful and uh, hopefully uh, I answered, uh, answered your question. Um, unfortunately, as far as that, again, coming back to your last question again, uh, breast feeding is not an option uh, in uh, breast reconstruction because all the breast tissue has been uh, removed. Um, however, uh, uh, in a breast lift uh, or a breast augmentation, or potentially even in a breast reduction, a woman still would be able to breastfeed. 
there are a couple of caveats. Uh, one, uh, we would want to know, have they breastfed before? And that's because of the fact that there is a small subset of the population that may not be able to breastfeed uh, and or to create enough milk. And so it wouldn't necessarily have been the surgery that influenced their ability to create milk, but that they didn't have that innate issue or ability to begin with. Um, is it safe to breastfeed with breast implants? Uh, it is. There hasn't been any sort of studies that have shown any implant material coming into um, the breast milk. Um, and as far as breast reduction, in that procedure, we are removing breast tissue. And so that could have an effect on decreasing the ability of the breast to create milk. Uh, studies that looked at women who were able to breastfeed then had a breast reduction, and then looking at to whether or not they could breastfeed again, there was a range of they could uh, without any needing to supplement with additional um, formula, for example, or they uh, could but needed to supplement because the amount of um, milk production that they were uh, able to make at that time after the breast reduction was much less than before because of the breast tissue that was removed. Thank you very much. What about scarring? and a breast reduction? So uh, the, the traditional breast reduction, uh, and I think a technique that most plastic surgeons use and uh, including myself and that we've been trained on is something called a wise pattern reduction. Uh, and that tends to leave a anchor type uh, scar on the breast, which means around the areola down toward the fold of the breast and then across the bottom of the breast itself. Uh, so that wise pattern uh, technique is still employed today, especially in women that are much larger breasted uh, and when we're trying to minimize uh, or remove as much weight as we can. Um, as uh, techniques have refined and perhaps women that are not as large breasted have presented for having breast reduction procedures, uh, whether because they just felt a little bit uh, self-conscious about their breast being too full, uh, or they do feel uh, a lot of the same similar symptoms of heaviness in their neck and shoulders. Uh, there are some uh, minimizing of that uh, um, incision pattern so that, for example, you can have just a lollipop reduction or a vertical breast reduction, where now it's again that around the areola scarring and down to the fold, but it's eliminated the across the fold uh, incision as well. Uh, there have been some other techniques that perhaps not as widely used in which uh, there is an incision made that ultimately is just along the fold and only around the areola missing that vertical limb. Um, ultimately, whenever you have an incision, there is a scar. So uh, there is no such thing really as a scarless breast reduction. Uh, perhaps as I say it out loud with the exception of people who have very fatty breasts with nipples in a good, if you will, position that can have a liposuction based treatment to reduce their breast. Um, then maybe it's only little poke holes that they would have. But typically in a breast reduction, we need to make uh, incisions on the breast to reposition the nipple and areola as well as remove the excess breast tissue. And so the uh, scarring is definitely um, evident at first. Uh, with time, it tends to fade, leaving just a light line, again, around the areola, down toward the fold, potentially across the fold itself, depending upon what technique is used. Thank you, Dr. Samra. Sure. Dr. Fortis, how much yeah. fat are you able to remove during a liposuction procedure? Well, the amount uh, of fat that we reduce, um, we... We, we arrive at that amount purely on the basis of safety. The more fat that's reduced at a single time, the bigger the scope of the operation, the bigger the impact it is physiologically to the patient. So for patients who come in uh, and are good candidates for liposuction, we reduce um, a maximum of about five liters of fat uh, and feel comfortable that they can go home immediately after the operation, provided that liposuction is the only operation that is done. Now, if, it's, uh, if liposuction is combined with other procedures such as breast work or abdominal plasty, uh, then usually I have the patient stay 23 hours under observation. When the amount of aspirate is between five and 10 liters, 
I uh, have the patients stay overnight under observation so that uh, they can be monitored. Uh, they have an IV, they're given fluids, their, um, their urine outputs uh, are measured. And so we, we know uh, how to take care of them and make sure that they remain in good fluid balance. Um, beyond a, a, an aspirate of 10 liters, I usually recommend that the patients have it done in a staged manner so that we address um, certain areas first, they can recover from the first operation and then I bring them back and do more. Uh, a lot of times if, if the amount of uh, fat that's aspirated is beyond 10 liters, which is not uh, common, um, then I usually address the issue of weight management uh, during the consultation. So it really depends upon several factors, uh, but certainly to determine if a patient um, should stay under observation, a lot of that has to do with the aspirate of fat that, that's done at the time of the operation. Thank you, Dr. Fortas. Continuing along those lines, why is lymphatic massage oftentimes recommended? Well, you know, for a long time, uh, as part of my practice of uh, liposuction and liposculpture, I would recommend that patients uh, have a series of massages afterward. Uh, not only did the massage help in the recovery and help in, in the reduction of swelling and also improvement of the scars within the layer fat uh, where the liposuction was done. Um, but I think it allowed for a, a faster recovery. Um, here in the last two to three years, um, I've been recommending other treatments, uh, including external radio frequency to also help in the recovery from operations such as liposuction and abdominal plasty. Um, but the, you know, these, uh, Post-operative uh, treatments, I think, are, are very important into the long-term success of the operation and also in, in the experience of the recovery to the patient. Um, one of the most important things that I have patients do, and I've done this from the beginning of my practice uh, 22 years ago, was that I have them wear compression garments. I think it's extremely important uh, for, for the recovery period, for the healing, and for the control of swelling. So it's not just a question of doing the operation and letting the patient um, recover without any, any follow-up or, or making any um, recommendations in the post-operative period on how to maximize their recovery. So these are the important things that I have recommended that I have found to be very, very helpful uh, in the recovery, uh, not just in the experience of the operation and the recovery, but also in the, in the uh, short and long-term success of the operation. Thank you, Dr. Fortas. Dr. Samra, yeah. is there anyone who wouldn't be a potential candidate for a breast reduction surgery back over to breast reduction surgery? Um, you know, I think that uh, in general, the it, it almost seems like a um, almost a sarcastic answer. I mean, if you if your breasts are too small, then well, we shouldn't really be making them smaller. Uh, so I, I think that the a more serious answer would be to say that uh, if someone feels that their breasts are too large, then we typically can do something uh, to make it smaller, whether they are obviously large uh, and or just large to them. Uh, I think people that wouldn't be appropriate candidates may be uh, for reasons that they have health issues that may not make them appropriate candidates for um, any kind of a surgery, much less an elective uh, uh, surgery. Um, Perhaps more specifically, uh, you know, if they have had uh, wound healing problems in the past or if they're on any medication that uh, makes them immune compromised, uh, people who uh, are actively smoking are typically a, a red flag of sorts for us as uh, the success of the surgery and the success and the scarring hopefully being as minimal as possible is very dependent on blood flow and or blood supply to the incision line. Um, when somebody smokes, uh, the nicotine in the cigarette and or in the vaping tool uh, or any other device that they're using uh, causes what's called uh, vasoconstriction, which basically means that the blood vessel, the, the tube, little pipe of the 
blood vessel constricts or tightens. And that's just what the chemical nicotine does to the blood vessels. Uh, studies showed that uh, one cigarette uh, way back in the day, again, talking cigarettes now, uh, could decrease the blood supply to the skin by about 25% for four hours. So most people don't have just one cigarette. Most people who smoke have, you know, quote unquote, half a pack, which we typically double when uh, people tell us what they drink or smoke. Uh, so you can imagine that uh, someone who has, you know, just a few cigarettes a day could be decreasing the blood supply to their skin by about, you know, a quarter uh, for almost a whole day or a 24 hour period of time. And so somebody who's actively smoking is at a much higher risk for having wound healing issues. Uh, that's not specific to breast reduction. That would also be in facelifting surgery uh, or even abdominoplasty surgery, uh, mommy makeover stuff that Paul was talking about. Uh, smoking is something that, you know, we tend to ask all of our patients and if they are actively smoking, we try to encourage them and help them as best we can to try to quit smoking. Ideally, someone will have been without nicotine for a good four weeks or a month before they would uh, have had uh, surgery. Uh, unless, you know, there's just no way to prevent it because the procedure they need is at urgent or emergent. Thank you, Dr. Samra. Dr. Fortas, what is gynecomastia? And is that something that you all see often and treat often there at your practice? It's a condition that I see quite often and it's, it's a very common condition that occurs in men uh, from uh, men in their teenage years all the way to men, uh, mature men much later in life. Uh, the, the term refers to the development of, of the male breast and it could be the development of uh, true breast tissue which we call glandular tissue, or it can be a fatty tissue that develops in the breast, or it can be uh, a combination of the two. And I often see both when I, when I um, consult with men who come in uh, because uh, they notice it. They sometimes don't have the language to describe it, but they know that it's, it's enough to make them uh, subconscious so that they them at their wardrobe or decide that uh, they're not comfortable wearing their shirts off uh, in the summertime at the pool or at the beach. Um, it's a common condition. Most of the time it happens for no other reason um, than there's an imbalance in the hormones in a man's body or a hypersensitivity to normal hormone levels, um, female hormones in, in a man's body. Sometimes it can be associated with use of medications uh, or use of um, illicit drugs. Um, uh, cannabis is one of the uh, recreational drugs that's often been associated with the development of gynecomastia. It can be seen in men who uh, use supplemental hormones for uh, performance enhancement or muscle building. So men who are very physically fed and, and choose to use these products as a way to maximizing their, their muscle mass, can see this uh, shockingly as a side effect of use of those uh, medications. And it's also seen in men um, who are overweight. Uh, and in those cases, uh, it can be fatty tissue that builds up It's fatty tissue primarily that builds up uh, in the breast. And sometimes it's, it can be even associated with an expansion of the skin. So the male breast takes on very much an enlarged female shape. And so the treatment uh, really depends on the degree of the gynecomastia and uh, the, the type of tissue that's primarily involved in the development of gynecomastia. In the case of, of gynecomastia, that's primarily fatty tissue. Liposuction technique is, is uh, very helpful, very useful to reduce the fatty tissue in the breast. In the case where it's glandular tissue or true breast tissue, uh, that tissue tends to be resistant to being removed by liposuction technique and usually a direct surgical approach uh, through a small incision hidden in the, in the areola uh, is done to correct the problem. And uh, 
the, when it's a combination of glandular tissue and breast and, um, and fatty tissue, which is probably the most common a variety of gynecomastia that I, that I see, it's usually a combination of the two techniques of doing liposuction to, to reduce the fatty tissue and uh, direct excision for the glandular tissue. Now, in, in cases where the gynecomastia has become uh, uh, quite uh, advanced, uh, and it's associated with expansion of the skin and even drooping of the skin. And, and those uh, patients that come with that degree of gynecomastia, I will often recommend some form of mastectomy or, or uh, complete excision of the breast tissue with the excess skin while preserving uh, the uh, areola uh, and, and reshaping it into a much smaller size. And, um, and it can be, um, recon and the breast can be, re the breast can be reconstructed usually with a, uh, a free nipple graft or free nipple areola graft, which is essentially making the areola smaller and then uh, re sewing it back onto the chest, uh, almost like a skin graft, to uh, alternative ways of, of reshaping the remaining skin with the nipple and areola in a reduced form so that the overall shape of the breast is more uh, a male shape than a female shape. It's a common condition that I see. I think probably it affects uh, at least 25 to 30% of men at some time in their life. Yeah. Um, most of the time, men don't talk to each other typically. And so they either research it or they, um, they come on their own, uh, really without uh, mentioning it to anybody that they're actually going to their plastic surgeon for an evaluation of, the, of this treatment. It's a, common, it's a common problem. I see a lot of patients with gynecomastia, uh, but, and, and those, those patients are usually the, some of the most appreciative ones that you can get them uh, looking back to uh, a shape that they now are, are less con self-conscious about. Thank you, Dr. Fortas. Dr. Samra, over to you. Going back over to different types of breast surgeries, a viewer wants to know, is fat transfer safer than getting breast implants? And is it a more natural look from what you've seen there? That's a good question. And uh, to, to some degree, you would think that perhaps uh, yes uh, to the as an answer to those questions, but um, unfortunately it's not that uh, straightforward. Um, first and foremost, uh, breast implant surgery is very safe. Uh, there has been a tremendous amount of research that's been put into the safety of uh, breast implants, whether silicone filled or saline filled. Uh, and arguably uh, there is no medical device out there that's been as studied and researched as breast implants have been uh, due to, of course, the sensitivity of not wanting a uh, device uh, to cause any sort of harm. Um, that being said, uh, fat transfer to the breast, which basically means taking fat, uh, of course, from one part of the body, collecting it, and then transferring it to the breast, uh, is a procedure that is uh, pretty commonly done uh, in an effort to try to augment uh, the breast, uh, make it a little bit larger, or to perhaps fill in areas of uh, uh, asymmetry. Maybe there's one area of the breast that's a little bit flatter than the other breast within that same breast. Um, so in general, I would say that fat grafting is done more so for small volume augmentation as opposed to large volume augmentation, which we would typically use breast implants for. Um, and it's also important to note that with fat transfer, that there is a process by which once the fat is removed, uh, it is technically not attached to any blood supply anymore. And therefore, once re-injected or transferred to the breast, those little fat cells need to find uh, new blood supply channels. If they don't, then those fat cells will in fact die and melt away over the course typically of a few months after the transfer has happened. So we know that a certain percentage of the fat that is transferred from one part of the body to another will survive and a certain percentage will not. 
the data on, well, what are the likelihoods of percentages uh, change and vary from study to study, as well as from technique of how was that fat harvested or how was that fat treated before it was transferred. Uh, suffice it to say that most of the uh, information out there today tells us that approximately 50 to 70 percent of the fat that we transfer will stick around, which means that 30 to 50 percent of the fat that we transfer won't. Uh, unfortunately, that doesn't simply mean that well, you can just put a whole lot more in the first time so that uh, you can be left with half of what you put in and that should be good enough. And that's because of the fact that physiologically or from a cell perspective, the more fat you put in, at some point you start creating pressure in the breast that damages or affects the blood supply and therefore will have a negative impact on how the breast uh, ultimately, or the fat rather, will ultimately take in the breast. To use fat uh, to create an augmentation that would be as significant as a medium to full-sized implant, usually the patient would have to go through more than one round of fat grafting, meaning they would have liposuction and fat grafting, they would heal from that three to six months later or longer, they would go back to the operating room to have some more fat grafting done, uh, trying to, in each subsequent fat grafting session, add a little bit more fat and a little bit more fat. Um, the other concern, uh, truthfully, is the fact that sometimes you could have more take or survival of fat in one breast compared to the other, though that may not be common. That may be another uh, issue that you now have one breast that's a little bit fuller than the other as a result of the fat grafting as opposed to with an implant. Uh, what you put in is what you get. And so despite the interest and um, arguably increased popularity of fat grafting uh, as a standalone procedure for breast augmentation, it's still not as common as using implants because of the straightforward nature of implants being able to predictably give you uh, volume and certain aesthetics. Fat grafting perhaps uh, is um, a, a good alternative. I think that from a perspective of answering the question of feeling more natural, um, you know, again, yes, I can understand that there may be a thought, well, it's my own fat and fat, uh, it feels like breast tissue as opposed to an implant. Uh, but the truth is that uh, implants nowadays, especially those that are silicone, are quite soft and uh, feel quite natural and perhaps only in situations in which there's quite a significant augmentation that's done. That's when you start to really be able to feel the edges of the implant and see some of the uh, uh, a shape of the implant more so than the shape of the breast. Uh, so I guess in a situation um, coming back to trying to answer the question and from both sides of my mouth, as they say, both yes and no, I think if it's a person who wants a, a modest augmentation, prefers not to have to deal with uh, having an implant or any sort of concerns that they may have about having an implant, then fat transfer is a very good choice and a reasonable alternative again, with the understanding that there are some setbacks, whether it be that they would have to go through that procedure again, uh, and or that they may not be able to get as full of a breast as they might be able to with a one-step procedure using breast implants. Thank you, Dr. Samra. Pleasure. Final question is to you, Dr. Fortas. What is the recovery time of an arm lift and what are the expected results? Does the procedure last forever? An arm lift is an operation uh, that uh, I do in patients who have excess skin along with excess fat in the upper arm. Uh, it's, it's had various names. One of the names uh, that's been used to describe it is bat wing deformity. I see it often in, in patients who have had significant up and down changes in their weight, either uh, from weight loss that they've done on their own or weight loss from um, bariatric surgery. And um, really the operation uh, that's designed depends upon the amount of excess skin and where the excess skin is located. I would say by far the, the, the most common form that I see is where there's excess skin really from the armpit all the way down to the level of the elbow. I've even seen patients where the excess skin goes even beyond the elbow into the forearm. And so the operation has to be designed to remove the excess skin where it's located. And, it's, and there are a couple of options typically that's done. One operation where the, the excess skin is removed in such a manner so that the final appearance of the scar lines up um, in the inner part of the arm so that when the arm is down, 
it's it's well hidden. And uh, the other variation of, of that is where the the uh, excess skin is removed in such a way so that the final scar is a little bit more posterior and thicker skin that usually heals a little bit better. The only um, uh, trade-off for that operation where the where the skin is removed more posteriorly is that the scar tends to be more visible when the arms are down from the back. Um, those are the patients that I see that come in typically for arm lift because their arms, um, uh, they're not happy with the appearance of their arms. And, or it may be someone who has been uh, thin most of her life and, and now is at an age where the integrity of the skin is not what it used to be and she's not happy with the loose uh, skin of the arm. And there are not very many alternative operations that are consistently good other than to remove the skin, which is essentially uh, what uh, is done with an arm lift or also called a brachioplasty. Um, I usually do it also in combination with removing the of the fat that's underneath the skin using liposuction technique. And often I do them in, in, in tandem. I remove the fat first and then I remove the excess skin. So it's really an operation that is very similar in recovery to the uh, liposuction component of it, uh, with the exception that there is uh, a scar that goes uh, along the inner part of the arm. Uh, the recovery is usually about a six week period where patients wear a compression garment for the purpose of controlling swelling. Usually during that time, I will have them start a regimen of, of uh, scar creams so that the final appearance of the scar is uh, as, uh, as inconspicuous as possible. Um, uh, typically it's an operation that does require probably six to 12 months in terms of managing the scar so that it looks as fine as possible. Uh, I've taken care of many patients whose scars heal extremely well, uh, but it, it really takes effort on, on the part of the patient to follow through with uh, the plastic surgeon to make sure that the scar heals as finely as possible. But it's a great operation. It, it, you know, I find it to be very reliable in, in correcting the problem. Some operations um, or procedures are less reliable, but this I found to be one that does what, uh, what it's intended to do, and that's correct the loose skin in that particular part of the anatomy. Thank you, Dr. Fortas. Thank you, Dr. Samra. Great content, great information that you both shared with us today. And each of you are such great partners of ours for the Hope Beauty Network. So we are very appreciative to you as well. Final thoughts, looking ahead to 2020 for viewers out there that are wanting to come see you both. Let's start with you, Dr. Samra. Well, we're looking forward to uh, things getting to a little bit more normal so we can have more face-to-face visits with patients as the uh, coronavirus scare hopefully uh, starts to uh, become uh, behind us or more in the rear view mirror than in the front view. Um, in the meantime, uh, of course, uh, as we mentioned before, I'm doing a bunch of virtual consults uh, so that patients can have the ability to meet me and get some of their questions answered as they prepare for potentially undergoing uh, surgery um, from the comfort of their own home. Uh, here in New Jersey, we're uh, looking forward to potentially sometime in the uh, mid to end of May starting to do elective procedures again, though there's nothing formal as of yet in terms of a decision made by the governor, but uh, signs are pointing uh, to, uh, to potentially end of this month where we can start doing that. Um, I think that, uh, you know, there's still uh, some time before the summer hits us for people to get some uh, perhaps minimal, uh, pr minimally invasive procedures done uh, in uh, May and June, such as the injectable stuff to hopefully feel good about hitting the beach if in fact that becomes a, a reality for us this summer. Uh, and then of course, uh, looking forward to 2020, the rest of 2020 being a bit more uh, successful for all of us uh, uh, rather than uh, the quarantine time that we've been sitting in uh, the last few weeks. Thank you, Dr. Samra. Dr. Fortas, final thought? Well, I, I am looking forward to the summer. Uh, you know, we've had um, uh, unusual times to say the least uh, in this spring where we've had uh, to observe social distancing and really uh, for safety reasons, um, 
be uh, be safe uh, with our staff and be safe with our patients. And my hope is that uh, when we are on the other side of the curve and and people uh, are starting to feel more comfortable about um, being uh, coming out of the of uh, a little bit of hibernation. Uh, I hope it'll be like a glorious uh, Russian spring and that we will start returning closer and closer to uh, more normal uh, conditions and, and people start getting excited about um, doing, doing things outside their home. Certainly, I don't think that we're gonna completely uh, uh, be uh, back to uh, the time that we were before that we're, we're still going to be a little bit on the cautious side as we as we venture out of our homes. Uh, you know, I, uh, I just uh, have this mask that uh, was brought to, to my office. And uh, so uh, uh, I'm using that when I leave the office. Um, uh, so we certainly are making adjustments. And I think the adjustments will be here for a while. But, but I'm hoping that people continue uh, to, uh, to be excited about uh, getting out and, and returning to as, as normal a life as possible. Thank you both again, Dr. Samer, Dr. Fortas. Great having you. Thank you. And wishing you a, a very healthy and very safe time ahead in the great states of New Jersey and Texas. Thank you very I, much on behalf of Hope Living and the Hope Beauty Network. Hope to my see pleasure. you in Miami. Much appreciated. Hope to see you then. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.